Welcome to Central Community. Thank you for being a part today. Thank you for being in the building and online today. I hope that God blesses you and you have a wonderful and great and blessed day today. God bless each and every one of you. There's a reason why I sing in this simple offering, pouring out my love to you. Though my heart cannot express all this joy and gratefulness, still I sing this song of love and thanks and praise. It's because I'm forgiven. It's because I am free. It's because you show me mercy and you believe in me. It's because you are my savior. It's because you are my friend and your love, it lifts me high. Greater than my heart can know. How could I not celebrate? How could I not bless your name? Singing out a song of love and thanks and praise. It's because I'm forgiven. It's because I am free. It's because you show me mercy and you believe in me. It's because you are my savior. It's because you are my friend and your love it lifts me higher than I've ever been. And your love it lifts me higher than I've ever been. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good things you've given us. We thank you for life. We thank you for love. We thank you for hope. We thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for being a loving God, a Father who saw our need and gave us your Son, Christ Jesus. We would ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you would come to this place, that you would be senior pastor. For those of us who need to hear your word this morning that you would speak directly to our hearts and that we would be open to receive that which you have for us we would ask that you would anoint the message and make it clearly and completely what we need today and that we might receive in a way that might change us god that might build and fortify your church god and make us the people you want us to be lord jesus we think about the problems in the world god the places where there's warfare where there's hunger where there's heartbreak in our own families, Lord, where there are needs of healing. We would ask that you would move in us right now, Lord Jesus, that you would make us the people who can bring the healing, who can reach out and make whole the hearts that are broken, God, and where our hearts are broken and where we need the healing, God, that you would come and that you would minister to us. Right now, Lord Jesus, in this place, make us your people because of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When the best of me is barely breathing, when I'm not somebody. I believe in, hold on to me. When I miss the light, the night has stolen. When I'm slamming all the doors you've opened, hold on to me. Hold on. 
When I don't feel like I'm worth defending When I'm tired of all of my pretending Hold on to me When I start to break in desperation Underneath the weight of expectation, hold on to me. Hold on to me. Hold on to me when it's too dark to see. I could rest here in your arms forever Cause I know nobody loves me better Hold on to me Hold on to me Thank you, Bobby. Uh, many, many years ago, there was uh, a new house, being, a custom home being built just up the street from my parents' house. And uh, we were excited about this new construction. And, and so we went there every day after all the workers left. And they started with the tractor and digging holes and all those things. And so that was kind of neat as a small kid to be able to go up to this place and in those days, we didn't do the mischief and tear things apart or stuff like that. We just went to look and to be a part. And as they started forming for the concrete and they put all the pipes in, uh, it was kind of neat. And as they poured the concrete and the slab, we thought, man, this is a mansion. This is a big house, four or five times bigger than our house at home. And, and we thought, man, whoever's going to live here is uh, rich, you know. And, uh, and they, they were preparing three lots. But for some reason, they were just building the one lot at a time. I guess the guy didn't have enough money. He, made, he had to make sure that he was going to sell this custom house. And so he started doing all the framing, and the electrical. The roof went on. The walls went up. And uh, it was fascinating to just go up there after school to, to just go see this thing. And, you know, we walked through the, the hallways, all the framing up, the drywall. We, and eventually they put windows in and they put a door and we couldn't go in anymore. I mean, it was locked. And, uh, but then they started working on the outside. And as they worked on the outside... They started forming for the driveway. And uh, as we went up there, we saw them forming it, and it was a wow experience. All the other stuff, we didn't care about. But right in front of us, there was something we didn't see in our community. They were pouring a concrete driveway. Nobody in our community had a concrete driveway. All ours was asphalt. And when we played basketball on our asphalt driveway, and if you fell down, well, you didn't have any knees after that. You had holes in your blue jeans, and, you know, and, and it hurt if you fell down. And we thought this was the coolest place ever. Because we could fall down on concrete, and it would hurt, but it wouldn't you know, cause damage a lot of times, like those asphalt driveways did. And so we just dreamed, okay, I hope there's a family that moves into this household and he has 
kids galore. No girls, just all boys, and that we can come up here and we can play in his driveway. And it was a long driveway, as long as his sanctuary to the house. I mean, it just seemed like forever. And it was wide. It was, and the house had a two-car garage. And you think, wow, and a concrete slab. And man, we can play anything on this. Probably couldn't play baseball because we'd probably hit it over the street and onto the neighbor's house over there. But we could play football. We could play basketball. We could play dodgeball. We could just sit around and, and skateboard with the old skateboards that had the metal wheels. Or we could skate with those strap-on skates, you know, and, and we could do all these things. And so we just waited for the house to be sold and for a family to move in. And eventually, after months of work, a family moved in. We saw them, and we all went up there, and they were moving in, and they got the boxes. And there was a man, and there was a young boy, I think he was, uh, well, he was a year older than me. And uh, we thought, this is cool. This is cool. And we just watched them move all their stuff in. And as we were there at the edge of the driveway, the man came out and said, hi. You know, he introduced himself. He introduced his son to us. And he asked us one thing. Would you like to help us? And we thought, okay, we're in. Now, we own this driveway. I mean, we've got invited to this immaculate place. And we started playing on a daily basis on this concrete driveway. And it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. The kid would come out, and, and Tom uh, was his name, and uh, we just had a blast. But Tom was one of those kids that, you know, he didn't have skills as being an athletic person. He couldn't catch a ball. He couldn't run very good. He just kind of slow at this point. He was more of a, a mind person of doing things of scholars and all that and just get outside and, and you know, he just couldn't do it. You'd throw him a ball and he'd miss it. You, we'd play dodgeball, and the object of dodgeball is to run away from the ball. Well, you could always hit him with a ball, because he never moved too fast. Or the object, if you couldn't move too fast in dodgeball, was the ball coming to you, you had to catch it. And if you caught it, you're okay. But he would always drop it. And one day as we were out there playing dodgeball, his dad had the garage door open. And he was watching us play. And he came out and he said, here, son, I want you to put these on. And he, held, he gave him two, two gloves, white gloves. And he said this, where all of us heard it. He says, these are magical gloves. They'll help you out. And Tom puts the gloves on. And uh, we go around and we play dodgeball. And the amazing thing happened at that point. He got the ball thrown at him, and he caught it on the first try. It changed him at that point. It changed who he was. Because he got a tool that his father had given him. He was given something by his father, and he believed his father that this would do something in his life, and it would change the game. It would change his life. And all he had to do was to put it on. All he had to do is take that glove. And it was huge. It, it looked like a man's glove. But it was magical. And you know, all of us at that point, oh man, wish we had a magical glove. You know? And you know, we thought, well, that's quite like cheating. You're really not supposed to be wearing a glove when you play dodgeball. Or when you play football. Or you play baseball. 
And look at our society today. Almost every pro that's in either football or, you know, I don't, is there a glove for basketball? No? Okay. That they're not cheating. But everybody else is cheating. Because they're given a glove and they think, okay, I can catch this. And for a while there, they even had gloves that had sticky stuff on it. And you just put your hand out and got the football. You didn't have to have no talent at all. And this guy, he still, Todd really didn't have any talent, but he started using the tools that his, God, his dad had given him. And every time we played, he'd bring his gloves out. He'd put them on. And every once in a while, he'd miss the ball. He still wasn't coordinated sometimes. But he did a lot better. And you know, as we walk through our life, God has given us a tool. He's given us an opportunity to be better at who we are and where we're going. He's given us a tool that directs us in purpose. And we're going to talk about three tools later. But today we're going to be talking about for me to live, to grow, and to mature. Because God doesn't want us to stay in the same point for all of us, for each and every one. God wants us to live. He wants us to live by accepting him as that Lord and that Savior of his life. And he wants us to grow in that relationship. And then he wants us to mature. And a lot of times we have to just start back at that, that first step all the time. That we have to live and we have to ask for forgiveness. We have to start over. And most people do that. And in Colossians, it tells us a story. It tells us uh, a portion of scripture that, that a man writes to a church. And he says, hey man, I love who you are. Because you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, to live your life. And from Colossians 1, 9 and 10, it says this. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And so today, let's talk about those three simple, easy ways to live, to grow, and to mature. And the first thing on the back side of your card, it says, for me, he ran. And there's a, there's a, on your card, there's a, there's a picture, a famous picture um, that's going around on the internet. You can buy it. You can put it in your house. I bought it. I got it at home. And it's about God, and it shows this, this little lamb that he's caught in some bushes. He's caught on a limb. God runs, ran to him, and helped him. And in our lives, for me, he ran for me. And number one, to live, the Holy Spirit provides power and motivation. The scripture says, for God is at work within you helping you want to obey him, and then helping you to do what he wants. God gives you power and motivation, just like that father did to his young son. Now his young son, when his father went away, and we were playing and looking at his gloves, he says, you guys, these aren't magical gloves. They're my dad's old golf gloves. And he plays golf all the time, and he just got brought a brand new pair, and I know that that's his old gloves. And they're not magical. But he didn't tell his father that he didn't know. And he believed it. And we all still believed it because this kid, before, he wasn't catching anything, and so with the gloves, it gave him power it gave him a motivation to 
try a little better in his heart and his life. And all it took was uh, an old pair of gloves. And in our hearts and our lives, God is working within you. And he's working to help you obey him. And not only does he do that, but what he does is he helps you to want that and long for it. And so to live is a tool. To live with this opportunity and God gives us the power to live. He gives us the motivation to live in our hearts and our lives. And that's what we need, that tool to live. We need that power and that motivation. The second thing is that he ran, he rescued for me. And number two, to grow. And the Bible provides guidance and perspective. And we need to grow. We just don't need to, to, to live, but we need to go forward in life. And Tom, he went forward in his life in, in an athletic experience. Now, he came to this new house. He had a, a great, big, huge driveway, and we, he had friends galore. He had a father. He had a grandmother, but he had no mom. And it seemed like there was just something missing in his life. We all had moms and dads. We all had grandparents. We, some had great grandparents. But all he had was his dad and him and his grandmother. And his dad was a doctor, and so a lot of times he'd be gone for hours and hours and days and days. And the only two people in that household was the little boy and his grandmother. And we would go make us cookies and milk and all those things. And so we had a time of our lives because we had a concrete driveway and cookies. And it motivated and it powered us to go forward in our hearts and our lives. It made us start to grow and mature. It says, the whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us in what is true, to make us realize that this is the wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us to do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared for every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. I've been frustrated at a friend that I have for over a month. And I've been talking to my brother about it, and he's kind of frustrated too. And we've been talking about how we, to, to help this person. And one day I was talking this week on the phone with him, and I said, Gene, you know, I just felt like the other day I was just going to take that person and throw them in my car and I was going to fix the problem. And Gene says, don't do that. And I said, well, Gene, I really would like to do that. And my brother says, don't do that. He says, it's called kidnapping. <laughs> and if you did it, you'd probably go to jail. And he says, well, that, that's okay. I, you know, I'm just so frustrated now. I, that's what I want to do. And I, I don't see a way out of this situation. And he says, don't do that. I says, well, if I did do that, I, I know that you guys would come and bail me out. And I says, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> and I says, well, why not? He says, I told you, don't do that. And you know, doesn't God do that to us? It seems like that's how we grow. God tells us, don't do that. And we think, well, I'm going to do that. We do that, and then all of a sudden, oh, we shouldn't have done that because we get put in prison, and then God's coming, and, you know, he's sitting by the bars, and he lets us stay there for a long time. And we ask God, why am I in this situation? He says, well, I told you not to do that. And it's that simple. 
we need to realize that the things that hold us down, we just don't do that. It's very simple, but Gene made me mad by saying those things. You know, he wasn't getting any answers to the situation, and there's still not an answer to the situation. But we just had to let it go. And we just had to pray about it. And it, it'll work out. It'll work out. And I don't know the outcome. And a lot of times in our lives we do the same, but to grow, the Bible provides guidance and perspective for us. You want to find something? I mean, just open the Bible. You have a question about it? Open the Bible and start reading it. And something maybe on that page will tell you a direction and purpose. Maybe not exactly for the answer, the, the, the question, the answer to the question that you have. But you could almost on every page of the Bible find an answer to the problem that you're in. You know, if you're lonely and tired, open up Psalms that says, praise God in everything. I mean, er almost every psalm. Everything. And so it gives us a perspective. It guides our hearts and our lives. And so use that tool. And God, he ran to us. And, and when, when we were caught up in that, that situation where we couldn't overcome the sins of our lives, God ran to us. And he rescued us. And he took us from that place that we were at to a better place. And no longer do we have to live in that because we're not bound by those things anymore. The things that used to trap us are not our traps. But God is still there for each and every one of us. And that's a tool that we need to use. We need to use the Holy Spirit and its guidance. We need to use the Bible as a, a guiding hand and, and motivates us to, to do something, gives us a little perspective of what to do and what not to do. And thirdly, it says that for me, he carried, for me, number three, to mature, other Christians provide support and accountability. Other Christians in my life support me and carry me away to the place I need to be at. Not only does Jesus carry us, but our family and our friends, our neighbors, our church people carry us. And they keep us accountable. They keep us to who we are. Tom was at the edge of that driveway one day before school. And he was bused to school. I don't know what school he went to. But he got on a bus and he went to that. He was on the edge of that sidewalk one morning. And the bus pulled up. And he was excited about going to school. And he started forward. And as soon as he started forward, the bus moved a little bit. And he went under the wheels of that bus and it's just crushing his legs and everybody started from the community because everybody was going to school parents were out watching their kids get to the edge and all of a sudden you're hearing these cries and everybody got up to where the bus was and um, the father was there the bus driver had backed up and there his dad came running out and I could, I, could, I could still visualize his dad working on him and he was in bad shape it was terrible he was bleeding his legs were crushed his dad was doing stuff to him that I'd never seen somebody ever do the great thing was that he's a doctor he knew what to do. And what he needed to do was 
for a temporary time. He worked on him, but then he did something amazing. He grabbed him and he picked him up and he ran to his car. He put him in his car and they went off. Didn't wait for an ambulance. I mean, they didn't have 911 then. You had to call the ambulance service and these great big uh, boats came to your thing like uh, Ghostbusters, you know, that, that thing that it looks really frightening to get into. But he knew that he had to get his son to a hospital. And he did. And a month later, two months later, I don't know, it seemed like forever. He eventually healed, but he came home and he was crippled. And he couldn't walk. His dad brought him out as, as the months went along. We'd go inside his house and, uh, you know, go to his bedroom. He was laying in bed. We'd play games with him inside. But eventually he got the courage and the father let him go outside and so he put him outside, but he put him in a chair. And I remember him carrying this young kid outside. And I thought, you know, I don't think I ever remember my dad carrying me. He carried him when he was hurting. He carried him when he was healing. And he carried him out on that concrete set him in a chair and he put his gloves on and we played dodgeball and we kind of felt guilty hitting him at that point because he's in a chair and crippled <laughs> but you know we did because he wanted us to do that you know we didn't throw it very hard at him we could have probably knocked him completely out of the chair and that would have been pretty cool, you know. To me, at that age, man, I, I'd knock Tom completely out of his chair. And he'd probably high-five me. But he got carried. He got carried to those places that we needed to be at. And we're crippled in our lives. Sometimes we put the gloves on and we think they're a magical thing and it doesn't solve anything. Sometimes we go through life and it's so hard we can't, we can't even handle it. But we realize that there are people around us that can carry us, that can hold us. And we need to be responsible to each other. The scripture tells us this about us as a church. It says, in response to all that has been done to us, let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. Let us not neglect our church meetings as some people do, but encourage and warm each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. One day, God will no longer run to anyone. One day God will no longer rescue anyone. One day God will no longer carry people other than those that are in his household. And that's a sad experience. And so it teaches us as we live our lives to go forward and do the, use those tools, but also accept the people around us. And if we see someone hurting, pick them up, carry them for a while, give them some magical gloves of a scripture, of a Bible, or a relationship. Give them life and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ when they don't know that he's even there when they're trapped with their things of their life that just hold them down and they can't go forward in life. Teach them. Show them. Guide them like God guides us. And so today, for me to live 
to grow and to mature. It takes our relationship with God. And so I hope that you have that relationship. Today, I hope you live the best life that you could live. Today, I hope you experience growth in that life and that you mature. Because what he wants you to do with those things is to help someone that right now is trapped and can't get out. Someone that needs to run to them is us. Someone that needs to rescue those people is us because we now are his vessel. He is no longer here. He has gone away, but one day he will come back, as Scripture tells us, and now it's our opportunity to be Christ in this world. And so today, you have a big job to do. An awesome job. A rewarding job that fulfills your life. Go give somebody today some magical gloves and it'll change their life. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for life. We thank you that you just don't give us life, but you give us some tools and an opportunity to live it. You give us the Bible and the Word of God in written form and in spoken form. You've given us a Holy Spirit of guidance and motivation that will move us forward in our hearts and our lives. You've ran to us, you make us grow, you've rescued us, and you want us to mature in life. You want us to have something that is awesome, and you want us to, to go forward today. And so, Father, as we're here today, we thank you for that life. We thank you for being our Lord and our Savior. And if we don't have that, it's just asking and God, I need you as that Lord, that Savior. I need to grow today. I need, need to find some guidance and motivation. And so help us to read the word and to apply it to our hearts and our lives. And for even if we don't open the Bible, to remember the scriptures that we've memorized in our hearts and our lives, that we've heard other people say, be thankful. Thank God for the blessings of your life. And so as we come, we are thankful. And as we go now, we have a responsibility. First off, to our family, to our friends, to the, all the friends that were here today. It says that as we gather in your name, outdo each other in kindness and in love. And as we look at each other and it says, man, I can't outdo that person, but I can't outdo this person. But that's not the point. The point is that we just need to outdo. Because God, you outdid all of us in your grace and in your mercy. And so God, we thank you for your touching hand in our hearts and our lives. Help us to go forward. Thank you for that big piece of concrete, marble, or whatever we have that gives us joy in life, that we do life. Thank you for the homes and the families and the situations that we're in. And God, we just thank you for loving and caring each and every one of us. So now bless us, guide us, and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as you go through this week, you're invited back to Central Community uh, tonight. They go to the Jackets for Jesus in L.A., and so all of you are invited this afternoon to, uh, what time are you starting to cook, Teresa? Or, three. Uh, three o'clock? Okay, so three o'clock this afternoon. If you'd like to cook, come on out and help uh, uh, Jody and Teresa and all the team. Uh, come on out and be a part of that team. You can go tonight to the streets. Uh, tried to start the van this morning, and I had to jump it. So this afternoon, we're going to have to change the battery of that van to get to L.A. So we will do that. And so, uh, you know, just one more experience. We had a lot of problems with power today. Uh, you know, we had computer problems this week, and so that's why the screens aren't on the two sides aren't going. But we fixed it. We're going. You got middle screen. Next week, we'll have both screens, and it'll be awesome. 
I had to learn a new computer and you know and so it's been uh, one joyful day you know and uh, you know and that's the way life is a lot of times and so if you want to be a part of uh, Jackets for Jesus uh, if you um, you know come on out be a part if you'd like to be a part of the, uh, the, the women's bre uh, breakfast next week uh, 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 lunch next week and uh, and come on out and be a part on Sunday, right after second service, we'll have a luncheon. And uh, on Tuesday, we have our packing team. We have our women's Bible study. We have a food giveaway. Uh, we decided to figure out how much it cost uh, for us to put that stuff in the basket. You know, if you went down to Stater Brothers or Amazon or something like this, and you'd bought that basket, and this week we found out that the basket that we gave away this week was worth $55. If someone went down and got the cheapest they could get, $55 for all that. And we got, what, 350 families, and so it's a lot of money that people are saving because you gave uh, to support our food ministry and central community, and we don't pay $55 for that. Most of that stuff we get free. So thank God. But uh, here's an opportunity for you to be a part of the packing team, the giveaway team, and uh, the supportive team of going down to paying the, the $50 or the $100 to, uh, to, to Feed America for the program. So all of you are invited. Uh, remember Sempre and all the things that are happening there, the kids in school and exciting things happening and uh, the buildings probably rained out and all that and drying out right now. So be praying for them and, and God bless each and every one of you. And all the joy that's in my heart and the peace of God is still since you died in my place it's all about grace your grace it's all about grace it's all about grace it's all about grace your 